this is working, yes, ladies. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to welcome you to Friday Night at the Carry. Uh, this is my first chance to welcome anyone to the Carry. My name is Josh Ginsberg, and I'm the new president of the Carry Institute of Ecosystem Studies. Uh, Thank you. I haven't done anything yet to deserve that. But I'll, I'll thank you. You know, Barack Obama gets the Nobel Prize, and I get nice applause. So I'm very pleased. Um, I am thrilled to be here tonight, uh, and uh, very much look forward to more Friday nights at the Cary. It's a remarkable thing. Steve Cohen and I were talking before, and he said, "You fill this auditorium on a Friday night in Millbrook." The answer is yes, and often we have people outside, and some people can't get seats. And it is a remarkable thing and a, and a great outreach to our community uh, to bring some of the great environmental thinkers of our time to this town and to this place, uh, both to educate us and, and you, but also to inspire us uh, to do more for our planet. Um, for those of you who are new to the Cary Institute, uh, as I am, uh, it's a remarkable place. It sits on 2,000 acres of recovering forest. I spent much of this morning with one of the 15 full-time scientific staff we have uh, walking through the forest and, and being educated on um, how long and deep history of the land influences what you see now. It looks like great forest, but, but the subtleties and differences uh, come out because of the way we have used the land over the last 300 years. Um, it is that kind of forest succession and forest structure is but one of the areas of expertise of staff at the Cary Institute. Uh, we think of the Institute as specializing on the uh, recovery and ecology of the Hudson River, uh, forests, uh, looking at the ecological underpinnings of Lyme disease as a way to better understand how to manage Lyme disease and hopefully reduce its impact on our lives. But the Cary Institute is also remarkably international, I've discovered. Uh, for many years, I worked at the Wildlife Conservation Society overseeing conservation programs in 47 countries in five continents around the world. And I thought, oh good, I'm coming home to the Hudson Valley. I grew up in New York City in Woodstock, New York, and this has been my home. And it's going to be really great because I'm focusing, I'll be able to see the research, but little did I know that we work from China to Chile, and in British Columbia, and in New Zealand, and in Puerto Rico, and in many places around the world. Uh, the staff of the Institute are uh, experienced and knowledgeable, and their uh, experience and knowledge is in great demand globally. So it is small and local and active global, and I could not ask for more. And I'm looking forward very much to my time here, and hopefully it will be a very long time indeed. Um, so I would like just to say thank you to the Aldo Leopold Society members. For those of you who don't know what the Aldo Leopold Society is, it's a group of, of supporters of the Cary Institute uh, who have uh, been dedicated and consistent in their support over a number of years. Uh, if anyone is interested in becoming an Aldo Leopold Society member, talk to me afterwards. Uh, one of the great perks is you can reserve a seat for Friday Night at Cary if you're an Aldo Leopold member uh, as a small token of our appreciation for your support. Um, now, before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'd like to mention that on October 1st, Nalini Nacardini uh, will be discussing her expertise, which is on the canopies of forests and trees. But what makes Nalini so different is that she does this in ways that are nonlinear and I think very inspiring. If you sort of uh, Google her name, you'll see a TED Talk. I urge you to listen to it as I did this afternoon. Um, and she works with preachers, poets, and prisoners to bring ecology into places that one would think uh, it would not be either appreciated or possible to do so. So uh, that's on October 1st. Uh, anybody who has a calendar in their head knows that October 1st is not a Friday night, it's a Wednesday night. Um, because of the schedule, we, we're, we're going to break out the mold, and we'll do Friday night of carries on Wednesday, the 1st of October. <laughs> okay. um, all right. Um, now, it is a pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Steve Cohen. Um, I've known Steve for a number of years. Uh, we've worked together at Columbia. I should say I've worked for him at Columbia. Uh, Steve is a native New Yorker and uh, is a distinguished environmental thinker in many ways, and certainly in many ways that we don't usually think of environmental. Steve is very interested in management, the management of environmental policy, and taking uh, lessons learned from the way people 
are and the way people manage businesses and communities and universities and, and applying that to environmental problems. Uh, he's been a fellow of the Ford Foundation, the Rockefeller Foundation. In his youth, he was very distinguished even before he got his positions in academia. Uh, but Steve has spent the last 25 years at Columbia University uh, in a variety of programs in environmental policy uh, and practice. Uh, he now wears, I'm not going to go through every title Steve has at Columbia, but there are quite a few. He is, I think, most importantly, the executive director of the Earth Institute. People know that Jeff Sachs is the director of the Institute, Earth Institute, but anybody who knows Jeff Sachs at all knows that there really needs to be an executive director <laughs> to provide structure and, and support and, and ongoing vision for the place. Steve does that beautifully. As part of that, uh, the Center for Environmental Research and Conservation, uh, where I've been on faculty for almost 16 years, is part of that, and that's how I got to know Steve first. Um, Steve is also the director of the research program on sustainable sustainability policy and management. It's a relatively new program, but I think it's fair to say that that program was in advance of the wave of everything being talked about in terms of sustainability. From my perspective, and most importantly, Steve is the director of the Masters of Public Administration uh, in Environmental Science and Policy. Uh, I say it's important because I've taught in that program for the last five years, uh, of course, on international environmental policy. Uh, Steve and I were talking at some sort of meeting, and I think I made the mistake of saying, God, I just wanted to teach international environmental policy. I've gone to Convention on International Trade and Endangered Species, and the UNFCCC, the Climate Change Convention, and and I really like an excuse to really read the literature. It was about three or four months later in August, he called me up and said, so what are you doing next month? <laughs> and it's like, I can teach in the spring. There is no way I can do the course in one month. Um, but so I've been teaching there. And again, it's been a, a pleasure to have Steve as my boss. Um, Steve is the author of a dozen books or so, a myriad of papers. Uh, his most recent book, Sustainability Management, Lessons from and for New York City, America, and the planet, right? so nested scales, uh, is a great read. Um, there are very few books that have the words management, sustainability, and that kind of uh, structured academic kind of approach that are readable, and sort of eminently so. But actually, I think what I would even more strongly recommend is that you can get Steve's tweets, or, or even better, subscribe to his weekly blogs on the Huffington Post, because that's where Steve's breadth of knowledge and his creative thinking uh, really show up. He is able to link ideas week to week, but even in some weeks, that weeks uh, in a single essay that really are thought-provoking. Uh, a couple weeks ago, he wrote one called Plastic Bags, Nuclear Waste, and a Toxic Planet. Right? Um, and so this evening, Steve will talk to us about the relationship between plastic bags, nuclear waste, and a toxic planet, among other things. Thanks, Steve. Principle is applied. 
applied to drugs. What that means is before we introduced a new drug into society, we test it uh, first on small animals and then eventually on the animals that are us. Uh, and we look at its side effects and then we decide whether we should introduce it, whether the benefits outweigh the costs. And if you're <coughs> like me and you watch old people TV, you know, they have the ad which tells you the drug and then the 50 side effects, okay? And that's the precautionary principle at work. They have to tell you the negatives. Introduce a new technology into society and we just do it and then wait to see what happens. In that respect, we're like the canary in the coal mine. You know, they drop the canary down. If the canary dies, there's too much gas, so you don't send the miners down. In the case of our economy, we're all the canaries in the coal mine. We wait till after toxicity is demonstrated, then we do something about it. Um, and so in, in many respects, environmental control starts not with prevention, but with end of the pipeline solutions. We retrofit an existing technology. We put a catalytic converter on a car. We put scrubbers on uh, a coal-fired power plant to clean things up. In some respects, that comes from sewage treatment because there are certain kinds of, of end of pipeline solutions that are inevitable. Uh, and that, that is, that's one of them. Um, so one of the questions that I continue to ask is, why don't we embed in the production process uh, a concern for the environment up front? Why do we have to wait until we've demonstrated the problem? So that's one of the issues uh, that I'm interested in. And also, is there a way to improve environmental policies? How can we improve them? Um, one of the most interesting things about the environment as an issue is how little we understand about ecosystems. Uh, we actually have many more measurements of economic health than we do of ecological health. And so we very poorly understand uh, ecosystems. It's a fundamental concept in management. It comes from Peter Drucker, the great management writer. And Drucker said, in order to manage something, you have to be able to measure it. He said, you can't measure it. You can't tell if what you're doing is making it better or worse. And so we didn't actually have national economic policy until we developed the gross national product, the gross domestic product, as a measure of the size of the economy. Because we couldn't tell if what we were doing was making things better or worse. In the case of ecosystems and ecology, we're just at the beginning of learning how to measure what we're doing as a species to the planet. And so that has to get much more sophisticated, much faster. Uh, and the reason for that is very simple. Uh, when I was growing up uh, in Brooklyn in the 1960s, there were 3 billion people on the planet. When I worked for EPA in the 70s, there were 4 billion people. Now, there's 7.2 billion. And if anybody thinks that doubling the planet doesn't have an impact on ecosystems, they're not paying attention. And so there's no question that we have a bigger problem than we used to have. My own philosophy and my own optimism, if you will, is that we can, in fact, manage it but we have to do a better job of paying attention than we're doing right now. So going back to understanding environmental policy, I developed this framework for understanding environmental policy. And part of it is that the environment and sustainability are inherently interdisciplinary fields. In other words, you can't just be a lawyer and understand it. You can't be a political scientist. You can't be an ecologist. You can't be an environmental engineer. You actually need, or a public health expert, you need all of those disciplines. And in fact, by looking at the environment problem, you know, economists say, well, it's market failure. Well, that's not the whole thing. Uh, it's not just market failure. Engineers uh, are a little bit blind to political reality. Uh, everybody forgets about the ethics and values that are at the root of why we have these problems. I mean, one of the reasons we have these problems is because we built a lifestyle that, guess what, we like. And you know what, we're not giving it up. And we're not giving it up very easily, and we probably won't give it up. So this framework I developed asks about every environmental issue, let's first understand this issue of values and ask the question, what kind of planet do we want to live on? Um, almost all environmental policy issues have at their heart a value issue. And, and the story I sometimes tell about this, I don't know if any of you remember a TV cartoon called The Jetsons. Anybody remember The Jetsons? Okay, so The Jetsons is a technological marvel and everybody's flying around their cars, dogs on a treadmill, they get their food from a, a hole in the wall, a pellet comes out. And, it's, and you know, the, the people at Hanna-Barbera that developed it, developed this as an ecological catastrophe. They thought that this was Armageddon and that people would be scared. 
In fact, everybody loved them. They thought, oh, when do I get my flying car? Um, there's no nature in the Jetsons. There's no trees. Everything's up in the sky. Nobody ever asked what happened down below. And so the question for everybody is, what kind of world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a world where you strap on a virtual ski outfit and experience the feeling of skiing instead of going down a real mountain? Now, in this audience, I, that's probably a truly rhetorical question. But when I see all the kids spending all their time in front of their computer screens, it may not be that big a leap uh, to the world of the Jetsons. So the question of, of environment, in one respect, comes down to what kind of planet do we want? The second way to look at environmental issues is as political issues. Uh, who wins and loses? Who gains and who doesn't gain? What brings an environmental issue to the political agenda? What gets it on the agenda? What I mean by the agenda is that there are a certain set of issues that our political system will legitimately deal with. They consider real issues. Okay? Uh, and then there are some issues that you just can't get uh, a hearing for. So an issue like gay rights or gay marriage, until fairly recently, could not make it on the political agenda. Then after a while, it goes from what we call the systemic agenda, the general issues that are concerned, to the political agenda, to the policy agenda, to the institutional agenda in legislatures and in courts. So you have this movement from society uh, from what's not a legitimate issue, what is a legitimate issue. And ask yourself the question, why is it that tobacco is legal everywhere and marijuana is only legal in Colorado? And the reason for that, it, it's not that tobacco is less dangerous than marijuana. They're both pretty dangerous drugs. One of them is very is, is legal and everybody can buy, and one of them is illegal. Alcohol, why was it prohibited for a decade and then stopped? You know, what makes an issue legitimate and what makes it not legitimate? Why is it that it took us uh, decades to think about issues like toxic waste? I, at the beginning of my career, I worked in the Superfund program. We've been creating toxic waste since the beginning of the 20th century, but we only regulated it in the 70s and 80s. What took so long? What took so long for this to become an issue? What, what made it a political issue? So I asked that question. And then another, another cut in an environmental issue is to, ask, is to look at it as an issue of science and technology. First of all, all environmental issues are because of science and technology. In other words, they're all created by science and technology. And the ones that we tend to solve are solved by science and technology. In other words, one gives and one takes. So the biggest environmental problem we had in New York City in 1907 was horse manure. Uh, we were knee deep in it. Uh, that problem got solved by the internal combustion engine. The internal combustion engine in turn created a set of other problems. Science creates a problem, science solves a problem. So one of the questions is, do we really understand the problem? And does the technology exist to solve the problem or mitigate their impact? Now, we have had enormous success in this country and in Japan and Western Europe in, saw, in making environmental problems less bad. And by the way, I, should, uh, I guess I should make that point. Policy never solves problems, okay? You make problems less bad. What political scientists say is that policy making is remedial, <coughs> remedy things, it's serial, you try it over and over again, it's partial. So if you question what I'm talking about, I will give you an example of homicides in my home city. In 1992, we had about 2,200 homicides. Last year, we had about 380. That's a less bad problem. If you walk around the streets of New York, it's safer today than it was in the 80s and 90s. But if you're one of the 383 dead people who were murdered last year, you're just as dead as the, as the thousands that were murdered uh, in the 90s. So the problem is less bad, but it's not solved. So in the 1970s, we saw our GDP going up, and we saw absolute pollutant levels going up right with it. At the end of the 70s, that decouples. The economy keeps growing, and the absolute pollution load gets lower and lower. Now, one reason is because we started to export some of our polluting industries. But that's not the major reason. The major reason was technology, sewage treatment, catalytic converters, scrubbers, all the environmental pollution control devices that science and technology helped us develop to help solve those problems. So that's another cut at the environmental issue. Another cut is 
thinking about it as a, a policy issue and as an economic issue. Now here we run into the ideology of the modern day. We have this idea, and it starts with Ronald Reagan who decided government was the problem. Uh, some governments are problems, but government is not the problem. Uh, in fact, the wealth of this country comes from a partnership between the public and private sector. It's always been the case. It will always be the case. Uh, you have to have government playing a role in the economy. If you don't, there's no rules. It's like driving on a road without stoplights. It's absolutely essential. And also, government has played a creative role in all sorts of capital formation, from the land-grant colleges that created uh, our agricultural technology, to the research and development that resulted in things like uh, microcomputers and the internet, all of them government-funded basic R&D. I mean, you know, uh, the, uh, I, I sometimes ask my class with the question, well, why did they make computers so small? Was it because somebody had in mind that they could sit uh, at a Starbucks and, and, and surf the web? I mean, where did that come from? Well, the technology came from a desire to shrink the size of computers so that when we had our guidance systems on ABMs, the ones that were aiming at Russia, uh, they, at ICBMs rather, they would land in the right place. They'd land in Russia instead of, say, France. <laughs> <laughs> and that technology became the technology that people like Steve Jobs used when they were uh, building the first personal computers. So the intersection of government and the, pri the private sector is simply part of the way the world works. It always has been and always will be. And so one of the questions is how do we shape environmental policies to encourage good behavior for corporations? How do you create a tax system? that makes it uh, easier to do renewable energy, that makes it easier uh, to have closed systems technology instead of dumping waste into a river. And, or at least punishes people if they do the wrong thing. So you can make it easier through incentives, and you can make it harder through, through punishments. And government has to play that kind of role. That's simply essential uh, in, our, in a complicated world. And finally, my own field is management. Uh, you know, I like public policy because I find it interesting. But as President Obama learned, you can have a great policy like Obamacare, 8 million people who didn't have insurance have it now. But if you don't pay attention to the website, nobody's going to ever know that you had a success. That was a catastrophic management failure, uh, not being able to figure out how to create a website. I mean, it sort of boggles the mind. And Amazon's able to stay, stay afloat the week before Christmas, why can't the government of the United States figure out how to design a healthcare website? Well, apparently they didn't. Um, so part of the issue that I ask is, do we know how to do this? Do we have the administrative capacity? Do we have the technical capacity, but can we apply it? I mean, you can have the technology and have the best ideas. If you don't have trained people doing the work, it doesn't happen. And management then becomes the last part of understanding environmental issues. So in any event, I developed this framework and I apply it to a bunch of problems to try to figure out what kind of problem is it. So I'll give you an example. Uh, New York City has some, had, tried to get something under my Bloomberg called congestion pricing. Now congestion pricing, uh, they have in London, uh, it charges you for entering the central, central district, the business district, and it charges a variable rate depending on how much uh, how, how much congestion there is. And it uses that money to pay for mass transit. So Mike Bloomberg was thinking about, okay, we're going to have a million more people in New York City by 2030. How are we going to get across town? So he tries to get congestion price. And the problem what, with it was political. He simply didn't do the homework you had to do in Brooklyn, uh, among the legislators in Albany, and they lost this on political grounds. So. Congestion pricing is a multi-dimensional issue, but the failure of congestion pricing in New York City had to do with political factors. Another issue, electronic waste. So how many of you have a cell phone or a smartphone that's over three years old with you? Raise your hand. How many have one that's over five years old? How many have one that's under a year old? And how many of you are desperate to get the Apple 6? <laughs> You guys are more conservative. I asked the same question as my class. Nobody had a phone 
that was over two years old. Okay? The, the point is that we have planned obsolescence uh, in these consumer items. And then, you know, most of you, like me, has a drawer of old PCs and old phones sitting somewhere in your house. Uh, and we don't have a way to, and I should say, the interiors of these machines uh, have toxic substances in it. And when it goes into the waste stream, uh, it creates uh, some real problems. Now, what kind of problem is this? Well, basically, it's a science and technology problem. You could create a cell phone without toxics in it, but we haven't figured out how to do that yet. We're trying. And in fact, the latest phones are less toxic than they were 10 years ago. You could also develop something where when you buy that phone or you rent it, you give it back to the manufacturer uh, and get a deposit back, say $50 or $75. We do that with tires in, in New York State. So that's part of why there aren't a lot of old tires sitting on the sides of roads anymore. We developed a way to bring that, uh, to recover that, uh, that old uh, resource. But an issue like science and tech, like electronic waste, has at its root, first, the value issue. We love this stuff. We're not born loving it. We learn how to love it. That's what makes it a value. Okay. So, and what, so one part of the e-waste problem is values. A second is the economics of planned obsolescence. These companies need you to buy a new phone every few years. You have to lust after that iPhone 6, you know, or the, the next uh, Samsung phone, whatever it is that you want to have. And they manipulate us to do that, and that's part of, the, of our economy. It's also a management issue because you can actually develop practices, organizational behaviors to collect toxics. So Hewlett Packard does this with toner. Uh, when you're finished with your toner uh, and you buy a new box, you put the old toner in the, in the new box and uh, UPS will pick it up for you uh, for free. And then Hewlett Packard remanufactures the toner uh, in the original container. And that's <coughs> simply a, a routine. People get into that routine and you can do that. Uh, but then it's easier, isn't it, just to toss it to the garbage and not think about it. Uh, and that's a value problem. So I also, in, in the latest version of this book, apply this to, to fracking. Now, fracking is an issue that I know is emotionally charged. I think there's lots of uh, better ways to, to fuel our economy than fossil fuels. But the fundamental is we actually don't understand fracking's ecological impact. We have it in our Lamont Dyer Earth Observatory people that study uh, the seismology uh, well below the crust of the Earth where this uh, where the fracking takes place. And we know that the liquid goes in, and we know a third of it comes out, but nobody's actually studied the other two thirds. And the stuff that comes out is only just now being studied to understand its composition. So how do you regulate it? How do you even know if the behavior is horrible or good if you don't know anything about it? And none of this was helped by the public policy intervention of a Mr. Cheney who exempted fracking from uh, our regulatory structure for hazardous waste uh, or even for water pollution uh, because of the national security imperative of developing more gas. But just the same, the issue of science is here. We don't know the real impact. The issue of technology, we don't know uh, if what's the long-term impact of fracking. And we've all seen the you know gas land and the different movies and stuff like that. But uh, that's not the same thing as a scientific study saying that the probability of, of risk is high and we shouldn't do this. And of course, we have the political issue. Uh, nobody wants this near them, uh, if you, particularly if you're dependent on the water nearby. So, and then it's a value issue. We don't want to destroy the countryside, but we do want the energy. And the people that pretend that they don't want the energy are lying to themselves. Uh, our use of energy is embedded in our lifestyles. It's just the way the modern world works. And to say that we're going to sit alone in the dark with a candle is not realistic, and it's just not going to happen. So when I talk about this in general, I say that the real hard issue that we have to address is we have to make the transition from fossil fuels to renewable energy. Uh, and we have to focus on a lot more attention on it. So in analyzing fracking, I basically say 
that <clears throat> this is a multidimensional issue, but it's dominated by our scientific ignorance and by the politics of NIMBY. We really don't understand if this is a good or bad thing. Uh, I personally am biased against it, but that's a bias. It's not an analysis. Uh, and, I, and I think that if we're going to manage the planet, we better really be thinking about cost and benefits in real terms. Now, I also applied the framework to global climate change. I'm not going to deal with that here tonight so I can move on a little bit, except to say this. The conclusion I've reached on global climate change is that it's not going to be an international treaty. Uh, and there's not going to be an international treaty because the people in India and China want what you have here in upstate New York. And they are going to get it. And the real question is, are they going to get it with by leapfrogging the technologies we use, or are they going to use coal-fired plants and the, and the rest going to get to where we are, uh, which will have a devastating impact on global climate change. Um, so when I look at the, at the issue of climate change, um, I see it as essentially an issue of science and technology. If there's a single sustainability issue that is most important, it is developing renewable energy that is cheap and affordable and convenient. And, the, and the, the way I sometimes put it is, when I was in graduate school in Buffalo in the mid-70s, the computer I had was the size of this room, and it had less computing capacity than my iPhone has. Okay? What if that solar array that cost you fifteen or twenty thousand dollars eventually became the size of a window, and you had a battery that could store a month's worth of energy with a week's worth of exposure to the sun, and that could power your whole house? Is that unimaginable? Anybody see the pictures of the first cell phones, the first portable phones in the size of my arm? Okay, and they look kind of funny when you watch them on television. Um, so. To me, this issue is an issue of science and technology, which brings me to the, the overall concept of sustainability management. So I start in my own studies. I, I first took environmental policy in 1975. I worked at the EPA in 77. EPA was seven years old. Um, and I always kept my two areas of interest, management and environment, separate. And it started to occur to me that, in fact, they're, they're really one concept, or that they need to be. So people interested in sustainability management are not interested in sustainability because they love nature. Uh, they're interested in sustainability because they love their lifestyle and they want to continue it. So the sustainability perspective is an effort to use management, design, engineering, and public policy to make economic production and consumption more efficient and effective, allowing us to have continued economic growth without destroying the planet. Now, a lot of people say you can't do it, we have to reduce consumption. And what I say is we actually have to change consumption. Our consumption has to be less destructive of the environment. We have to recycle, we have to use anaerobic digestion, we have to use renewable energy, we have to be thinking about the impact of our human behavior on the planet. And we're already doing it, in some ways we don't recognize it, when I drove off to college, I had my car filled up with my records and my books and my hi-fi, filled my whole trunk. When I drove my daughter to college, she had more music than I had in this little <laughs> iPhone or iPod, whatever it was, and more information in her computer than I had in my whole library. And it was smaller and less resource consumptive than the lifestyle I had. So we can imagine technology helping on this. <clears throat> We have to get past this idea that there's a trade-off between economic development and environmental protection. And the reason for this is that all wealth comes from the ecosphere and human ingenuity <coughs> manipulating that ecosphere. You destroy the environment, there is no wealth. Now, to give you a graphic example, get off the plane in Beijing and, and start breathing. You have a business, you're thinking of relocating to Mexico City or Beijing. Get off the plane, see the yellow air, get back in the plane and say, I'm not going to that place. In New York City, we used to dump raw sewage directly into the Hudson River because we didn't have a sewage treatment plant. Now, there's a reason why Riverside Drive is a quarter mile from the river. You really wouldn't want to get too close to the river before we had sewage treatment. There's a reason why Fifth Avenue and Park Avenue are the highest value residential streets in Manhattan. 
they're the two streets furthest from the East River and the Hudson River. Because in the summertime, those are both moving sewers. Now, there's a bike path that goes right along the river. And even Donald Trump has built apartments overlooking it. It's wonderful. <laughs> The point I guess I would make, though, is that people are always asked the question, should we grow economically or should we protect the environment? The environment is part of our wealth, you know, because we are biological creatures. We have to breathe. You can't build a gated community around bad air. I mean, you could wear a space suit, I suppose, but, you know, who wants to live like that? I guess that's the value issue. So sustainability management is organizational practices that result in sustainable development economic production and consumption that minimizes environmental impact and maximizes resource conservation and reuse. Now, this is not to say that we make the world pristine. It's not to say we're going to move back to nature. I love Pete, Pete Seeger, may rest in peace, but I can't afford 150 acres on the river. And nobody that I know is going to be able to live that way for the most part. We have too many people, and it's too late to get back to the land. I know that you people live in a beautiful rural community, and, and I think it's wonderful, but for the average person on this planet, they're going to be city dwellers. As of 2007, a majority of the people on this planet live in cities, and the percentage goes up every year. And so we have to make our cities uh, less destructive of their surrounding area. Now, right now, managing the planet is beyond our current capacity. We have to learn how to do this. We need to maintain our natural resources, we need better technology, we need better organizational capacity, and we need a government that is willing to move industry and people in this direction. We need new technologies for all these things I mentioned here. We need to learn how to measure the planet better so we can manage it better. We need public policy that will bring sustainability technology into the economy quicker than it is right now. And I would give you the example, by the way, of those smartphones. You know how many smartphones, how many cell phones there are on the planet right now? There are six billion of them. There are people in Africa that have cell phones that don't have electricity. They go to a central place for a few dimes and recharge their phone uh, once a week. They have leapfrogged the technology of landlines and telephones. Okay? Can we do that with energy? Well, we better. Because if we don't, uh, Everybody better learn how to swim really well, because we're not going to we're, we're all be underwater. So the requirements, well, let me just, I don't have enough time to get through all of the things I wanted to say to you. So let me just say this about management. So I'm a management professor. So management professors teach about finance, production, marketing, um, organizational behavior, strategy. And the average manager, um, that's really all they used to need to know. That's changed over time. In the 1930s, we developed for the first time something called generally accepted accounting practices. Those were developed by the Securities and Exchange Commission because every company used to report whatever they wanted to report. And so there was no common metric. And so you really couldn't have a, a true public trading system. With the development of accounting practice, generally accepted accounting practice and public reporting, you were able to develop that. Again, flash forward to sustainability in the environment. We don't have those kinds of measures. In the 1960s and 70s, managers had to learn information management with the advent of cheap computing in the 80s. So managers had to understand performance measurement. At the beginning of the 20th century, the global economy developed, 21st century, the global economy developed, and CEOs had to learn how to navigate in an international environment. Now, the new management concept that managers have to understand is what we call the physical dimensions of sustainability. The use of energy, the use of water, the use of materials, the impact of production on ecosystems, the impact of consumption on ecosystems. Today, the managers of the next 10 or 20 years to be competent are going to have to be sustainability managers. And we're starting to see that. A company like Walmart will not buy supplies, will not buy things for their store to sell unless the supplier has demonstrated that they have adhered to certain sustainability principles. That is the beginning of a revolution in management uh, that gives me a certain amount of hope. This transition 
to a sustainable economy has begun. This is starting already. The real question is, it's a race against the consumption of the developing world and our ability to develop a high throughput economy that doesn't destroy the planet. I think we can do it. I believe we have to do it. I'm counting on human ingenuity to make it happen. But I'm not counting on ingenuity alone. I also think we need public policy. I think we need government to play a role in pushing this. And you say, well, you know, government's not good at that. Government's the problem. Well, government has actually been pretty successful in a lot of things it's tried to do over the years. It doesn't get a lot of credit for it. There's this thing called public education. Well, yeah, that's government. Um, it's not the greatest, but you know, most people can read. Um, <laughs> government has a far higher level of competence than the media would allow you to believe. And most of the actual work of government happens at the local level. And so most people's image of government is from the federal government. But in fact, the work of government, picking up the garbage, making sure that good water gets uh, delivered through the water system, plowing the roads and all that, are done reasonably well. Uh, they compare favorably with many other things uh, that go on. Also, government, when it sets its mind to doing something, is able to do it. Before World War II, America was a nation of renters. After, the, after World War II, with things like mortgage interest deduction and the guaranteed mortgage and the government's role, particularly for veterans, in insuring mortgages, and we went to be a nation of owners. And being a nation of owners was a public policy. We wanted people to have an ownership stake in society. And home ownership was one way to do that. That was a government public policy. That wasn't an accident. And government is capable of doing a lot of great things. Now, for sustainability, We've got to fund the basic science. America's research universities, people that I work for, I'm a lobbyist here, are the best in the world. And it is government funding that makes them the best in the world. We need to fund infrastructure like smart grids. We need to fund the technology needed uh, for sustainability. And we need to transfer these technologies to the developing world and make sure that they get brought there before they do the same kinds of things that we do. So we need an engaged citizenry to do this. We need public policy. We need better science and measurement. And we need everybody working together, believing that this can be done, which means we need political leadership. So with that, I think I've covered most of what I wanted to cover tonight. And so I'm happy to take any questions you may have. I hope I said something controversial.
Yeah. Do you have any faith in, in NEPA and CEPRA and, and that process? Or do you think sure. It's real limited. I think no. Uh, actually, the the fellow who wrote who wrote NEPA, Lyndon Call, wrote a book called Making Bureaucracies Thick. What NEPA does, what all of these acts do, is they cause a pause <coughs> where you look at impacts, as opposed to going hell bent to make something happen. So if you can get a thought process going, that's a step forward. Now, you have to have some data to think about, and some of these environmental impact statements um, happen, some don't. But I think all of these processes are useful. They, and, they, and I think all of our environmental laws, frankly, are why you still have some beautiful surroundings here. Uh, but at the same time, everybody knows that place they used to hike when they were a kid that's a strip mall today. And so, you know, we have to understand the pressures on this land, and that's where I think, in fact, uh, redeveloping cities and concentrating population there is better than, uh, than the alternative. Way in the back. So you mentioned the importance of measuring things, but somehow, even after centuries of double entry bookkeeping, we still can't trust the books that companies keep. Somehow they're fraudulent anyway. Right. And the idea of green GDP has been out there a fairly long time, and somehow we can't be convinced. So if you don't want to know, the measurement won't help. Well, actually, measurement always helps. It's a starting point. But then you have to audit and you have to verify. Anybody who self-measures and there's no possibility of your line getting caught, that's not a real thing. So in the case of, of measurement, you need to have a process. You know, in the case of environmental regulation, polluters have to report on what is going out of their pipes. But the EPA comes by once in a while and checks to see if that's correct. And without that fear of, their, of an audit, measurement is medium. Now at the same time, the percentage of the, the probability of being audited is important. So the IRS, for example, is doing less audits now than it ever did. But they still have this wonderful strategy of auditing celebrities. So you figure, you know, if Paris Hilton can get audited, so could I, right? In, in other words, that's been their philosophy since they began audit. So you have to create in people's minds the idea that if they don't report accurately, that, that it could get caught and punished. Otherwise, measurements mean The EPA does have less money than the IRS, not much less, but actually what EPA has is we have a federal system. So it's not just the EPA in Washington, it's DEC here, it's the local environmental agency, it's actually citizens in interest in environmental groups going out and testing the water, which happens also. So in fact, there's a lot of people uh, measuring uh, pollution, and in some cases for corporations, it's the kids of the CEOs. And they get home from work, and the kid says, well, look at what you did, uh, which is actually a more uh, important enforcement action than anything the government can do. Uh, let's see, in the back there? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure, you and then right now. Excuse me. Um, I applaud the, the work the Perk Institute is doing in Columbia, uh, but I'm wondering what's happening at, uh, at other business schools. Um, well, I'm not in the business school. That's the first thing. Okay. Our business school won't even talk to me. <laughs> it, it is a problem. Um, come up, but there is, for example, uh, Santa, UC Santa Barbara has the Brain School of Management. They've been doing this for a long time. Willamette University has a sustainability program. Bard up here has a green MBA they do down in New York City. The Earth Institute has a sustainability management degree that I direct. Uh, so it's happening. It's happening because uh, business schools are, so it can be somewhat slow to, to change. Well, what's going to happen? I mean, what's interesting is, I mean, Columbia's business school didn't even do international business until Mayor Felber came from South Africa and became dean and said, "What's all this American stuff?" So, in fact, uh, it's, it will happen. I, I don't, I don't think there's much chance of going. I'm sorry, behind you. Yeah. I have a lot of questions. Actually, I'm going to try to condense them into a few. Okay. I've been trying to research this. I've watched a film called Gas Hole, which I would recommend to everyone to watch. You've mentioned the EPA. And during 9-11, I remember the EPA saying, and I lived in New York City, then saying that the air was clean. And it was not. 
They actually didn't say that. Uh, the White House said that. The EPA reports, the, the EPA reports OMB, because I know the people that did it, okay. the EPA report, in fact, said there was a danger, and the White House changed the report, so. Okay. I remember something, I don't remember the last name, Christy, who was the EPA director. Christy Whitman, yeah, Christy Fowler. Didn't she say in a report that the air was clean, and it, was tur and it turned out that it was not? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned, of course, the government, being able to help us with these things, and I'm not so certain that I trust that what's coming out of the government is actually true. Well, let me, let me take a few of those questions. Please. Um, the government is as accurate and as true as we make it. And so uh, if you find, uh, just, I know the people who are the technical people in the EPA, they're competent, in fact, excellent scientists. They know what's going on. They report their results to the political level. Sometimes the political level tells the truth, and sometimes it doesn't. But we're the people that put those people in power, okay? Uh, and then sometimes you may not be the one who voted for them, but still they're in power. So just to say, there is no alternative uh, to the government for uh, making public policy. That's their role. So we have to have that. Now, in terms of, of uh, you know, measurement and things like fracking. I think that any competent scientist will tell you that our knowledge of this is primitive. The money that's gone into the, the engineering and the technology has been in exploiting the resource, not in seeing whether or not the resource is safe. Most of the money that, that is actually there to analyze the environmental impacts is coming from the U.S. government, mainly from the National Science Foundation and the National Institutes of Health. And so, in fact, without that money, we would know almost nothing. And, and you know, and I'm not saying it's a cure-all, but it's the only thing that's, that's really worked so far. And in fact, environmental regulation in this country has worked. The air today is cleaner than it was in 1970. The water today is cleaner than it was in 1970. And certainly, this has happened with the growth of the economy and a huge growth in population. So it's not that we've solved the problem, we've made it less bad. Let me take some other questions. Yeah. Um, I'm here with the environmental science class from Miller School. Um, and can you help um, frame a question for us to bring back to our campus and how we as a small um, high school can fit in what are things we can do that are concrete and fit into your model? Um, and also, as these students move forward in their career, what's the message that they can move forward with? I think one of the most important messages is we need more scientists. Um, I think that, that uh, particularly more women scientists, uh, which is starting to happen. Uh, there, I think we need to pay more attention to understanding the planet. We have to manage the planet for the production we need, for the things that we need. And in order to do that, we really have to understand ecological impacts. Think about our human behavior as the independent variable. The dependent variable is the impact on the environment. We don't understand it well enough to reduce it uh, as much as we need to. We've done some things pretty well, and we're getting better at some things. We're learning more. You know, one of the great, the great things that we've done in the last 20 or 30 years is, is things like diet uh, has improved dramatically. Obesity levels are going down. People are thinking about what am I eating? You know, what's coming into my body? And people are exercising more. All of those kinds of things are really part of this whole drive towards sustainability. So now you think about your own body embedded in an ecosystem, in an environment. So you now have to pay attention to that, like worrying about what you're eating. So I guess that would be, those would be some of the messages I would advise your students on. Uh, yeah? Um, you mentioned how the population like, doubled in size since you were younger until now. Um, what are some No, actually, there's a very interesting thing that's going on called the demographic transition. Um, what happens is, um, as people get wealthier, they have less children. Uh, as societies get wealthier, and as prenatal and, and child health care gets better, uh, children in traditional societies are an economic asset. Uh, you need them to work the farm, you need them for Social Security, and because a lot of them died, you have a lot of them. Okay? Now, children are what sociologists call decorative. <laughs> They're lovely to have. I love my daughters very much. 
but I'm not expecting any return on my investment. <laughs> most, most of the revenues have been going in the out direction. And, and I don't expect that to stop. But what that's done to population growth is Japan is not replacing its population. Western Europe is not replacing its population. We would not be working out for immigration. And in fact, even in parts of the Middle East, you're starting to see capping of population. So everybody, most demographers assume that the planet would cap at around 10 million once you had full economic development. Now the projections are close to eight and a half to nine billion, which is manageable if we learn how to manage the planet. But in fact, population itself, uh, you know, people are living older and people are living healthier and younger people are surviving into adulthood in much greater numbers here and all over the world. And that is a sign that technology can, in fact, fix some of the deepest problems human beings ever face. And my colleague Ruth DeFries has a new book on how we're actually producing more food than we can use right now. Uh, planet well, we haven't distributed it effectively, but we throw away massive amounts of food, and we overproduce food wildly. And it's an incredible it, it example of human ingenuity and technology applied to a deep problem. Where does my next meal come from? We have to apply that to all of these other areas. And it really means we need to focus attention on it. We need a sort of national moon project to develop renewable energy. I mean, to me, the energy issue is the central one. Yeah? Two quick questions. One, um, New York State, as you know, has got an ongoing study. Oh. Yes. <laughs> it's what I call a political study. <laughs> I, I, yeah. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that the study, uh, well, the health people are doing some studying. There's some studying going on. Uh, I don't know the people doing it, and there's certainly not people that I'm aware of. So I don't really know what's going on. I think that it's, it's a very closely held process. Uh, normally, when you see these things going on, people like Josh and I will know some of the people who are doing the work. I don't know anybody doing any of this work. Uh, at our School of Public Health, we have a division of environmental toxicology. Uh, people like Joe Graciano and Pat Kinney are on my faculty that study the effect of environmental toxics on people uh, and on ecosystems. And none of them are working on this study. Now, maybe they know more than I do about it, but uh, everything tells me that uh, until November, we probably won't see much from this study. <laughs> <laughs> the other, other question is the sphere, international. Well, the reason for that. Well, the reason for. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I was supposed to repeat the question. I'm sorry. I should have repeated that. The, why am I so pessimistic about an international treaty? Um, and the reason I'm pessimistic is that for a treaty to take place, you have to have equal interests. Yeah. And so. Russia and the United States didn't want to blow each other up because it really wasn't in our self-interest. Now you could say it's not India or China's interest to destroy the planet through global warming. But the problem with global warming, with climate change, is it's a problem that's caused everywhere and its impact is on the future. The political regimes in power need to deliver economic growth to their population. Part of it is because they see the way we live. Those, those cell phones and that YouTube and all the rest of that has created images that are all over the world, and that creates an irresistible political force if you're a political leader in India and China uh, and in Africa, but particularly in India and China, because the technology is there for at least communications. And so they can't accept a limit on energy. So you know the, the problem with the treaty process is the goal has been to raise the price of fossil fuels to make renewable energy more feasible. I have a different solution. Let's make fossil fuels irrelevant by lowering the price of renewable energy. In other words, drive fossil fuels out of the market by making them irrelevant. And, and you know, it's possible to do that. Uh, and we've seen that kind of techn technology replacement over and over again in our economy. So it can't happen. And in this case, we're, it desperately needs to happen. And that should be the focus of public policy. I, I think this debate about, you know, Stopping at 350 parts, oh, that, none of that is going to work. What's going to work 
is giving people in the developing world everything we have without using coal-fired power plants to get it. And I think that that is the technological fix that will solve almost all of our environmental problems because it makes things like uh, composting, anaerobic digestion, one of the problems with it is that it takes a lot of energy to move that food waste around. Make that energy renewable and suddenly it becomes much more cost effective. Desalinization, same thing. Play in the back. Could get that. Um, I have a question about toxic waste. Dutchess County and I think many other counties in New York State have resource recovery agencies. So we have days throughout the county in different towns where you take your used electronics and mm -hmm. your antibiotics, those two things especially. What happens to those when they get them? I mean, I mean we take them and you sign up for it. And I think it's great, but I, I wonder what happens to them. I think they said them all in New Jersey, don't <laughs> 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 I'm just here. No. <laughs> uh, it, the answer is, is that in most cases, if it's going to a responsible resource recovery plan, the materials are detoxified, they're sent for resource recovery. There are some companies that actually tear apart old electronics to get uh, the, the rare metals out. But part of what you have to be careful of is uh, there are some unscrupulous operators who then send it to the developing world. There's, pe there's, there's pictures of, of children pulling these things apart and dying from it. So uh, my hope is that the ones up here are, are using responsible contractors. But in fact, there is the risk that it's being mismanaged. I mean, there are unscrupulous evil people everywhere, uh, which is why I think having regulation is important. Where do the antibiotics go? I'm afraid I don't know. Yes, over there. Yes, uh, to go down to Rappers from the International, my own experience is that when you're dealing with local governments, particularly the planning process, the people involved aren't that particularly interested in reducing driving, what we call it planning vehicle miles travel. They aren't really too keen on fiscal impact analysis, which is just technical and boring, all the rest. Even though, let's say, not the EPA, but I know the Federal Highway Administration makes drive reduction one of its goals, but also New York State, I know the top the Park Transportation is trying to get any community or county to reduce uh, the load on their expenses to maintain the bill roads. Well, all that sense, how do you communicate what care systems you have to get the local government to get on the bandwagon uh, and really begin to measure performance, which they don't want to do, the best I see, and they don't want to put it in the comprehensive plans. Well, I don't think I can repeat the question, but what I, what I would say is this, that gover the government that we get is usually the government we deserve, and that when people organize themselves and pay attention, uh, they often get better governments than they ignore. Most people are fairly apathetic about what government does, which leaves it open for economic interests and people who have uh, a stake in the game to dominate the process. But every once in a while, people get mad when something goes badly, and that often creates a lesson for a long time. And I think, in the end, it's up to us, it's up to everybody to pay attention and get involved. Yes? Um, so you said that wealth comes from ecosystems, but it seems the more technologically advanced we become, the more resources per person we use, like all the resources that come from this building for all of us to get here. Mm -hmm. So do you think that will continue advancing technologically and using more resources per person? Or become more renewable in the future? Well, first, I think eventually the car that took you here will be an electric car running on renewable energy, so that will help. I think more and more people are moving to cities where they walk and take bicycles and mass transit, and that will help. I also think our personal consumption uh, is changing, and the nature of it is changing. Uh, but, uh, you know, a lot depends on how people's values go in the future. Do I have time for another one? One, one or two more questions? Okay, over here. Yeah. Do you believe that if we drive more Priuses, use more cannabis grocery bags, and turn down more federal stats as individuals, we can have a significant impact? That's the first part of the question. The second part of the question is, if that's true, if we can, then why isn't someone getting that word out there? Because there aren't any well, the question is, what's the impact? You know, will individual behavior make a difference, and why isn't there more positive uh, individual behavior toward the environment? 
I, I guess you have to take a longer view than that. Uh, I think that people are paying more attention now. Uh, I think that uh, the younger generation, you know, in polling data, is more environmental than older people are. Uh, I think that uh, individual behavior matters, but systems matter more. Uh, I think that we have to, the two things are not mutually exclusive. I think people have to think about their impact on the planet. It all starts with us thinking about our impact on the planet. But I think at the same time, there has to be something you can do. And if there isn't something you can do, then, you, then you're going to be trading off your lifestyle against the impact on the planet, and you figure it's somebody else's problem. But I think in general, individual behavior and learning, social learning, people thinking about nutrition, people thinking about environmental impact, all that makes a difference. And, and I think that, you know, in a way, change starts with, you know, every individual. And I believe that. Um, okay, last question. nature that we, or relatively pristine nature, 
but it's something that happens in cities as well. It's, it's really important to making the world a little place. So thank you for your interest. Thank you for your support. Uh, I mean it. If you really want to become part of the Otto Leopold Society, just come up and ask me. And uh, I look forward to seeing you all on the first of uh, October.